Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I am your host, Rex Bear, and we have returning guest Bob Mitchell with us, a journalist, best-selling author, researcher, lecturer, executive for MUFON Canada, and co-founder of Toronto Newswire Services. Now, a couple of Bob's most recent books, Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind, as well as Intrusion, Alien Encounters, are going to be the main focus of discussion here tonight because there's just a bunch of stuff in there that I know many of you that listen to The Leak Project enjoy hearing about. So these are just a few of Mr. Mitchell's gems from a collection of several books that he's put together. So quite the resume, Bob. And last time we spoke, it was about the book Forbidden Knowledge, Tells of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. And I spoke with you as well as Jason. That was just a great podcast, a lot of really good reviews. I really enjoyed that. And when I read that book, you put it together so well, it was just very exciting to read. I had a tough time putting it, to da- uh, putting it down. So let's dive into your most recent works. And first of all, how the heck are you? I'm fabulous, Rex. Uh, our uh, Forbidden Knowledge is still number one on Amazon's Kindle and uh, going strong. And uh, now it's time to get back to the, uh, the normal alien type stories that I usually have been doing. And uh, What If Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind is the kind of book that... I think people, your listeners, will be both informed and entertained, and, and that's what I try to do every time I write something. I like to inform and entertain at the same time, and uh, certainly there's there's a lot of different kinds of stories in, in that book that uh, have never been told anywhere else before, and, and they are all first-timers in the book, and um, all very different, and I'm sure that uh, the listeners will be intrigued by what I have to tell them. You hear that, folks? You're going to hear it here first at The Leak Project. That'd be great, Bob. Let's get into that. Yeah, some of these sure. uh, these close encounters of the unusual kind. Uh, mm-hmm. What's the first one that comes to mind? Well, one of my favorite stories uh, is actually the first one in the book, What If uh, Close Encounters of the Usual Kind. And it's my favorite story because uh, it took me in a completely different direction than any other alien experience story that I ever um, encountered. And it also kind of opened my eyes to another possibility and and I think after after the listeners will hear this story they will more likely than not have a a different take on what uh, abductions could be and 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 how connected we are to just everything in this universe so um, it's a very very interesting story and you just want me to to tell it is is that the way you want me to do it yeah Bob that'd be great let's jump right in walk us through it like uh, describe it as you would in the book to where we're kind of engulfed in the story Yeah, and if you have any questions, please uh, stop me, and and I'll be happy to answer them. And if anybody who's listening has a question, uh, I'll take that too. But um, so um, the person in the in the book that told me this experience is a name. His name is uh, Satya Anon. Now, Satya Anon is actually his real name, or his a name given to him by a Tibetan monk. Uh, It's not the name people would know who he who he goes by here in uh, North America. Um, he's, he's fairly well known in Canada, this person, and he's a producer, director, uh, a two-time daytime Emmy winning uh, uh, producer in, in the United States uh, a few years ago with some things he did on uh, the Discovery Channel. But at the time we were uh, sitting down to talk about uh, his experiences, he was in negotiations with uh, uh, some people who were going to give him several million dollars to do a project. and. He wasn't quite sure what the reaction would be from them if uh, they found out he had this uh, other side to him. So we decided not to go with his real name, per se, that people would know him by, but still go with a name that was given to him by a a Tibetan enlightened master, basically. So he's a real person, and it's his real name. It's just not the name that most people would know him by. But uh, the story is absolutely true. So um, he was born in Montreal and grew up in a normal family. There was nothing unusual about him except that, that he, he got into uh, meditation very early in life and it became a, a basically a lifelong passion for him and, and something he did every day and still continues to do every day. And uh, he was fascinated by some of the people he met in Montreal who seemed to have um, connections to people in Tibet. And there was a family that not only had connections to Tibet, but they took their son over to Tibet to uh, to meet one of these enlightened masters. And so Satya thought that was uh, really cool that uh, that a parents would would do that. So he uh, you know begged them to give him the, the contact information for this uh, enlightened master, and and eventually they they did. And uh, he went over to India with some friends originally, but uh, 
actually spent about 29 years of his life, not all at once, but uh, off and on with nine different trips over to India and actually uh, stayed in one of those Tibetan temples and, and learned everything he could about mysticism and, and um, incarn reincarnation. Um, he, he became a firm believer in reincarnation and he also became very, very adept at astral traveling, much like uh, Jason Quitt could do. Um, Although he didn't uh, have the same, you know, uh, time travel experience that Jason Quitt did, his was just the normal astral traveling where he would leave his body and and just sort of go to places and experience the the oneness with the universe. Now, when I was first um, uh, sat down to talk to him, um, I didn't know much about astral traveling, um, and you know, I had heard about it and and really didn't know anybody who ever did it before. But I'm since finding out. Uh, with our book Forbidden Knowledge that quite a lot of people seem to know how to do this but to me it was completely foreign so I, I asked him like well like how do I know that any of this is really true that, that you have been doing this and he, he told me a story about how when he was over in India his uh, girlfriend at the time was back in Montreal in the townhouse they were sharing and he did an astral traveling from India where he he left his body and, and actually went into the townhouse that, it, that they were sharing with and much to his uh, surprise uh, his girlfriend was having an affair with somebody else and uh, he saw it clear as day and, and back then we didn't have the cell phones we didn't have the you know the internet that we have now there wasn't instant text messaging so uh, what he did was he did a small tape recording on, on one of those uh, mini cassettes and put it in the mail and I guess two or three weeks later it arrived in Canada and when he arrived six months later um, he went to the girlfriend's house and you know she was quite embarrassed and admitted the entire affair that, that he had seen happening before his eyes even though they were thousands and thousands of miles apart so um, in my mind you know that you know, I don't know the girlfriend, never talked to her, but I, I had no reason to believe he was lying to me. So I thought, well, that's, that's pretty neat that he could have done that. But all his experiences were, you know, in the astral world with 360 degree vision and, and really wasn't into UFOs when this was, uh, was going on and didn't know much about aliens at all. He, he might have heard about the greys, but it was just something he, he just wasn't in, interested in. Didn't even, um, it wasn't even something he believed that I don't think at the time. But one day, uh, about, uh, I think it was five years ago now, um, he was with some friends and, and they came back to his Toronto condominium and his friends went on the balcony um, and he decided he was just going to go into the bedroom for a few moments and have, I guess, a, a power meditation nap just, uh, just to recharge his, his batteries, I guess. And um, he laid down and then uh, the way he tells the story is almost within seconds of, of lying down and he had this uh, feeling like he was being shot out of a cannon, out of his body, and it was a different experience than he had usually had with astral traveling before. And what happened almost immediately, he not only was shot out of his body, but he was shot through the roof of the house and, and he up through the atmosphere, and before he knew it, he was in outer space and uh, traveling very fast, and he could actually see the planets go by. And, and he could recognize the Earth, and it was getting smaller and smaller, and then, you know, Mars and Venus and all the planets. But as this was happening, he actually looked down at himself, and lo and behold, uh, it wasn't this 160-degree experience that he had had before. Uh, at, at this time, he was actually, he could see his body. He could see the docker pants that he had on when he uh, would lie down in the bed. He had the same running shoes on. He had the same T-shirt. He could feel his face. Um, and, and, and his hair and so he was in this physical form yet he was traveling through outer space with without a space a suit on uh, he was breathing fine and he was just you know accelerating faster and faster and uh, could not figure out what was going on and eventually he left the uh, the solar system and he expected that to see you know more stars and, and keep going and suddenly he found himself in in just other blackness there, there was nothing around him whatsoever but as he sort of floated there, because um, the acceleration had stopped, and, and as he floated there, he, um, he had this feeling that there was something or somebody watching him, staring at him. It was almost uh, ear eye piercing. Uh, he described it as uh, if you're in a car and you're stopped at a, at a stop sign or stop light and you look over because the person in the car next to you has been staring at you, and when you quickly look over, they turn their head quickly so they don't want you to know. Uh, it was that sense that something was staring at him, and it was really strong. And suddenly, in the distance, something is coming towards him. And 
you got to remember, he doesn't know anything about aliens really other than grace. So uh, before he could, you know, take a deep breath, if that was possible in outer space, but before certainly he had any emotions of fear or horror, uh, what he was looking at, right in front of his face, like within inches of his face, was this huge being. And um, he describes it as being at least 30 feet tall, perhaps even in bigger. And it had giant eyes and the head, and the head he, f he thought had to be at least five feet uh, large because the, the eyes were three or four feet big. And it had the image of uh, almost a mechanical insect. That was the way he described it because the head seemed to be like, a, like an insect, but the, the long arms that were flailing by its side, um, it, they seemed almost mechanical in some ways. But uh, instead of feeling fear, he, the only emotion that came to him, and it was a very, very strong emotion, was this overwhelming feeling of love and attachment to this being. And it was kind of love that uh, he said was stronger than even the kind of love that you would have for your parents or even uh, your, your wife or girlfriend. It was, it was this intense love that filled his entire body. And while he's there, there's a telepathic communication. And, and during this telepathic communication, he has this feeling that he knows this being. And, and, that, and it's so strong that he, he asked this being, have, have we been together before? And the answer he gets back is yes from the being. And then he says, he, he looks at the being and he looks at himself and, and he, he telepathically says to the being, in your form or in my form? And the answer he gets back is, it's in the being's form. And, and that really you know, freaked him out at that point. And uh, then he asks him, uh, will we be together again? And the being says, yes. And again, he says, in your form or my form? And the being says, in its form. And... Within seconds of that, he finds himself back uh, in his bed, and he wakes up. And when he wakes up, he has this, uh, you know, uh, wow moment because all his life, he, he believed in reincarnation. He believed that, you know, he has had past lives on Earth, and that he has, um, um, you know, possibly even been an animal or, or a plant, but it was always Earth-based. And now suddenly, he had this revelation that. Uh, reincarnation wasn't just something that happened on Earth, but when you came back, you could come back as anything in the universe because we all were connected to one source. And and sometimes you live a life as an alien, and sometimes you live a life as a human being. And uh, he quite soon tried to you know look up on the internet, find anything that resembled what he had had seen up there, and. Um, he eventually found something, and of course, it was the well-known mantid creature that that uh, has been very popular in the last, I would say, the last five years at least. People are talking all about mantids all the time, and and in fact, in in my book, Intrusion: Alien Encounters, there's two people that that have had mantis experiences, and although their experiences were with seven or eight foot tall creatures, they all had the exact same uh, overwhelming love for this creature. It, it wasn't any fear whatsoever. So after, after digesting what uh, Santa Anya had said to me and, and knowing that um, other people have had this experience, uh, it seemed to me that um, this love, this strong connection uh, is actually something that has happened in a past life. That these are celestial beings that, that are part of uh, everybody's uh, makeup and that uh, the reason there's so much love between them is that they're actually probably looking at your relatives. Uh, from another timeline maybe or from another dimension but somehow the mantis beings are connected to humans uh, because uh, most humans who have had abduction experiences certainly don't describe abductions by greys or hooded beings as being nice and loving it's always fearful and, and horrible so I, I think the Santa, uh, Santa Anna's experience um, may just open the doors to a lot of people uh, who have had these experiences it, it certainly made me rethink some of the things that were happening. And, and in fact, maybe if I can take that even one step further, um, if reincarna reincarnation does exist in everywhere in the universe, um, perhaps that when people are being abducted, and, and I believe they're probably being abducted mostly in, in, a, in a conscious form, not in a physical form, but when they're abducted into like the fourth dimension or other multi-dimensions, that perhaps they are being abducted by their own relatives. Uh, that somewhere along the line they've uh, you know they've told them that when they come back in this form you will be taken back to see us again because so many people that I've talked to 
during their abduction experiences, at some point they have a telepathic communication that says to them, you know, uh, we're doing this because you agreed to this. And I don't know anybody who would agree to such an experience unless there was something that they can't remember. And to me, that all connects somehow, uh, that we're all connected in the universe. And, and what we think is a, you know, a, a bad experience probably is an experience that uh, most abductees have agreed to in another past life. Now, have you talked to people that have been abducted against their will and have been basically tortured or what they yeah. describe as very painful? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in my book, there's a lady named uh, uh, Osi, uh, Josie, sorry. Um, and, and she's had you know, very uh, horrible experiences. But I must tell you, uh, after some of her experiences, she did have the same telepathic communication that told her, you agree to this, don't worry, uh, it's just part of your path. So I don't know what that means, because she says I certainly would not have agreed to what they were doing to me. But in, in any event, what, what happened to her was, just like uh, Santa Anon, um, she had no real knowledge of UFOs. She, she um, grew up on a, a native Canadian reservation in Newfoundland and uh, had a real bad childhood, um, uh, basically lived in a shack with no running water or, or no uh, heat or anything and eventually when she was old enough she left and, and came to Ontario and made a life for herself and um, had a relationship that didn't go very well but they she had a, a young daughter out of it and uh, one day she just decided that she she needed to get out of Toronto so she she moved outside of Toronto and and everything was fine except suddenly she started uh, um, being able to contact dead relatives of people uh, uh, for out of the blue she became a median and she has no idea why that happened or how it happened it just sort of started and and one day uh, there was a woman that she was uh, doing a, a I guess you call it a service or I don't know what you call it when you do uh, somebody in a, in a mediumship but uh, the woman kept saying uh, you're supposed to meet this this person and uh, he, she gave the name of the person and of course uh, uh, Josie had no idea who this person was and and eventually during one of her the it wasn't a seance it was more like a just um, a knowing of, of something that a dead person wanted to wanted to tell them um, she got this image of a of a person and, and even thought that this lady had a relative of this particular name um, I can't remember the name right now but it, it turns out it wasn't the name that this person usually went by so when they did finally meet um, he was into UFOs and uh, it sort of convinced her to go to the Alien Cosmic Expo last summer in Brantford, which I was at giving my talk on on some of the uh, the people in my book Intrusion. And I actually met her there, and um, we got talking. And it turns out, um, about six months before uh, she went to this UFO show, she started having these uh, incredible experiences, and and. They always started the same way. In fact, as long as she can remember, even as a child, she had terrible nightmares. Although when she woke up, she couldn't remember anything. But now as an adult, um, she was having these nightmares uh, every night. And it was always the same. There would be this terrible nightmare. She'd wake up shaking. She'd sit up in bed. She was uh, frightened and, and, and couldn't remember anything. And then almost immediately, uh, she had an astral uh, out-of-body experience. And, and this was something she had never experienced before in her life either. And she would find herself on spaceships and lying on tables and um, gray-like beings, although she said they weren't actually the kind of grays most people think of being grays, but they did have big eyes and, and for, bet, for the want of a better description, they, they were grays. Um, and, and they were torturing her. I mean, they were sticking things in her, up her, and... and uh, she remembers screaming. The pain was unbearable, and and at one point she she uh, said it, it felt and she, it, looking at it, it was as if they actually took a hand and put it right through her her stomach, and she could feel this pain all the time. Um, another time they put something down her mouth, and she thought she was going to die because she couldn't breathe, and and they kept telling her relax, relax, uh, you've um, we're not going to harm you, and you've agreed to this, and and that really confused her, but. What really confused her even more was, and, and this is where I get back to where I think a lot of abductions are actually taking place in, uh, in the conscious world and the, the fourth dimension, is that uh, before uh, she ended up on the spaceship, it felt to her as if she was flying and that she was in the, uh, the eyes of a bird. 
although she couldn't feel the wings or anything. Uh, she could see all around her, and she, she had this sense she was a bird flying. And when she got in the spaceship, she actually uh, would tell me that she didn't, she couldn't see her body. She could only see what was happening to her. And that sort of goes along with what I'm thinking, that, that the abductions are taking place there. It's your consciousness that's being taken somewhere because you're lying on uh, in bed, usually sometimes with your spouse, and the spouses say, you know, you never went anywhere during these experiences. And um, Josie had a, you know, a young child. And at no time during any of these experiences did the young child ever, you know, come running in screaming for mommy saying, where are you, where are you? So um, she was there in consciousness and we all know that the mind is where pain really exists. So if you don't realize you're there in consciousness and you think you're there in your physical body, I think it's, you know, it's quite understandable to think that when experiments are being done to you, you're actually feeling physical pain. She, uh, she said the pain was just overwhelming, and, um, but there were never any scars on her body until one time she had a, she had a scar uh, uh, on her chest, and it was, um, it was, she thought it might have been some kind of uh, reaction to, a, to something she had been washing with, but um, it never went away for a long time. It, it wasn't, didn't hurt, it didn't itch. It just was a, an elevated, almost scar tissue that disappeared eventually, but um, that was the only physical uh, trait that she had that she had been anywhere, but there was a lot of psychological memories about that. And a couple times she remembers being in a spaceship and actually seeing cities, and the cities to her looked like they were just sort of floating in the air above the land. Um, and there's also one time she, she felt as if she was in a, a single spaceship, uh, almost like a pod, and yet while she was uh, traveling, to this distant planet, uh, at this time when she looked down her, from her eyes, her hands actually looked like that of a typical gray, that, um, you know, there were three fingers. So what I took from that is perhaps that uh, when you do experience some of these things, to be able to take you places, you have to, your consciousness has to go into another physical entity to be able to withstand such a journey. Um, other than that, I have no reason to I don't really know why she thought she she was a gray at this time, but again, the 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 theme was there that you've agreed to this. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you, and and she still has these um, nightmares today, um, and she's actually going to be one of the guest speakers at uh, this year's Alien Cosmic Expo, uh, talking about this. But uh, where's that at? And when, it's in when? it's in Brantford, Ontario, uh, which is about an hour's drive west of uh, Toronto and another hour drive uh, east of Buffalo, and it's June twenty fourth to the twenty sixth. And um, so that you know, and here was a person that didn't want to tell anybody her story before, but uh, uh, she felt she needed to tell somebody it. And, and that's the interesting thing about all the people that, that I have dealt with in, in my two previous books that deal with experiencers. Um, every single one of them uh, mostly hid all these stories from everybody, but they're really uh, close family members or close friends. In some cases, they didn't even tell their family members. But they, they, uh, they were all between 40 and 60 when they told me their stories. And it was a, almost this dirty little secret or a burden that they've been carrying around all their lives. And after talking to me, um, they all said that this tremendous feeling had been relieved and that they now felt like almost completely different people, that they, they no longer were, were afraid to talk about it, that uh, they got something off their chest that they had been they kept hidden all their lives and, and it's, it felt so good to, to be able to, to tell somebody and now they don't care what anybody thinks of them. They know 100% that they've had these strange experiences. Um, so, you know, in some ways, I've, I've uh, I mean, I feel like I've helped a lot of people, even though I'm not a psychologist, I'm certainly not a, um, you know, not a doctor of, of, of anything, um, but I'm a good listener, and I seem to be able to uh, get people to tell me their deepest secrets. So, um, it's been an incredible, uh, interesting ride for me, as well as for them. Sure. I definitely need to get you in contact with a couple of people that have reached out to me here at the Leak Project. Their mm -hmm. testimonies are astonishing with what they've seen and been through. It's incredible. And matter of fact, some people that I know that won't come on the show, <laughs> some of the stuff yeah. that they've told me is just it'll blow. It's more incredible than what we've you know. I mean, it's just blow your mind type stuff. I mean, it's like something I, out of a I science know. fiction movie. I know. And I, and we always think of abduction as being you know just they come down, pick you up, and take you up, and and do some experiments on you, and then drop you back off. But I'm finding that that. 
everybody has a different slant and there's something slightly different to every experience. And, and it's not just the, you know, they pick you up in a spaceship and take you somewhere. Uh, there's all kinds of things that go on during these experiences. And, and it, it, you know, the rational mind can't explain it. But, um, and that's part of the reason why I think some of these people are so afraid to come out because, uh, you know, it's, it's not something you can go to your doctor and talk about. It's not something you put on a resume. Um, so who, who are you going to talk to? And, right. and, and one of the people that I, I did talk to from my intrusion book, um, her name is Marian Anderson. And she is an amazing person because uh, she is completely deaf. And uh, I met her at one of the very first uh, UFO meetings that were held in Brantford when I first uh, moved to Brantford and, and began working with MUFON. We, um, we decided to have a, a chapter in the, the town I live in just to see if there was any interest. And um, we booked a coffee shop, put a little ad in the local newspaper and thought maybe we'd get 10 people showing up at the coffee shop. And uh, little did I know the interest in our area because uh, we had about 75 people show up to that first meeting. We, we couldn't fit them all in the coffee shop. Uh, everybody had a story to tell. Um, and there was this Mary Ann lady who, um, you know, she was waving her arms and, and trying to get my attention. And, uh, and she eventually did. And of course, when I went up to her, she couldn't, I couldn't understand what she was saying. She did speak out of her mouth, but it was, you know, like a lot of people who are, are uh, hearing challenge, they, they don't uh, pronounce things the right way. So you were only getting every second or third word. And so she wrote it down saying she has stories to tell me and she'd love for me to come to her house to hear it. And I couldn't figure out how that I would do that because certainly I, I didn't know anybody that had sign language. And, and um, but she assured me that she would have somebody there who would uh, help me understand what, what she had been going through. So I showed up at her house and her uh, boyfriend's uh, uh, son and daughter both were uh, new sign language. So they helped me through uh, understanding her story. And you know, she had had the typical stories of, of beings coming through uh, her walls, through a portal, um, grabbing her out of bed. And you have to remember, she is uh, living completely in a silent world, so she can't hear them. And she can scream, but uh, this is all, you know, very terrifying to her because she can't explain this to anybody. And, and I thought, well, how terrible it must have been for her growing up because, um, you know, it's it's hard enough for people who can see and, and speak to, you know, explain what has happened to them or even tell anybody. Imagine if you lived in a world of total silence for all your life. And I mean, I didn't even know if there was such a sign language for UFO or aliens. And, and with her waving her arms like that, people would automatically assume that she was crazy and, and they would probably run away from her. So her, her stories were quite incredible. And, and uh, the most amazing thing about the whole experience is that over a period of uh, several months as she was telling me her stories that, that appear in the, in the book Intrusion, Alien Encounters, uh, she became a different person. She uh, started out this very introverted person that I had met at this coffee shop. And by the time uh, the book had come out, um, she was actually standing up at these meetings and now speaking uh, uh, and people could understand her without sign language. Uh, it was just a, an incredible transformation and she says because she was able to tell something that she had kept hidden all her life that now she felt invincible and almost felt like she owed it to every deaf person around to tell her story because I looked on the internet at the time and I still do every once in a while and I have never ever found another deaf person who's an experiencer. So I don't know if there is. I mean, there probably are, but no one that I can tell has ever come out and told their story before. And the other incredible thing about this that is that uh, she's become a you know pretty good friend of mine and my wife. And uh, when she comes to our house, uh, almost instantaneously when she met my wife, uh, there was a connection somewhere, and she was able to use sign language. My wife was able to talk with her by moving her hands around, and my wife doesn't know sign language. But whatever she was doing, she could understand perfectly what Marianne was saying. And in fact, it was so funny because I'd be in the same room and trying to listen to her and she'd be telling me, no, no, get, get my wife to tell her what she's saying. <laughs> it's, it was bizarre, but uh, That's pretty she cool. just became, yeah, I know she just became so, uh, you know, and she's going to be at the Alien Cosmic Expo too uh, on Experience Day. And, and she now paints, so she paints pictures of aliens and, and angels and all this stuff. Um, 
it's you know in in one of the uh, episodes that she had, uh, she was taken on a spaceship and uh, it. She looked down and there was this giant tidal wave that came over and was destroying all the homes in the area that she was uh, living at the time. Um, she was never able to figure out if this was a, a future vision, um, but uh, she had lived uh, for some part of her life on the west coast in Vancouver, and we all know that Vancouver is on uh, you know, a fault line and a tidal wave line, and so who knows if that was a vision of the future that she had. Um, her, her very first encounter with uh, aliens, uh, she has a clear memory of this, and, and this was when uh, she was just a baby in a crib, and she was an orphan. She was in a Toronto orphanage, and at the time she had some hearing, but there was something wrong with uh, the eardrum because every sound people made, it was excruciatingly painful. And so with all kinds of kids in the orphanage, uh, there was this noise continually, and she cried all the time because the pain was unbearable. And one night, uh, she recalls that three alien beings came to her, stood over her, and touched her ear. And at that point, she went completely deaf, but the pain ended. So she figures that somehow there was some connection, and they helped her. Uh, she doesn't look at it as, as uh, you know, being something bad. She looks at it as something that uh, she needed to go through. And, and a few years later, she, she also recalls being in a nearby park where she um, – was walking down a path and suddenly saw a, a spaceship and a little being in front of it. And when she looked to the left, there were several other children all being led into the spaceship. And the, the, the being was motioning her to come too. Um, she did walk up very close to the spaceship, but something told her not to go any further. At least that's what her memory is allowing her to remember. Um, she doesn't know whether she actually went on that spaceship or not. Uh, but from what I understand, talking to many experiencers, a lot of um, their experiences end with blackouts where you don't know what's going, what's happening at some point during the experience. So for all she knows, she may have been taken aboard that, that ship. But um, to her, she's never had any uh, bad experiments done to her that she can uh, remember, although almost every single experience ends in a blackout period. So who knows what's been going on to her, but maybe that's something they do so that she doesn't remember some things that might have happened to her. Right. Yeah. And, and also, I'm thinking of a gentleman we had here on the Week Project a while back that reached out to us. His name is Ray, and he's says he's a lifetime contactee, and he claims to have made contact with all sorts of different types of extraterrestrials and even, I guess you could say, interdimensional or outer dimensional <laughs> beings. And one that, you know, and, and talking to him, I mean, some of the stuff is so far out there that you can tell he's genuine when he's talking about it, that he's not just making it up, but you're just like, wow. I mean, is, is he, yeah. you know, is this, you know, how much of this is true in his imagination? But one thing that was very fascinating was he talked about these elephant people. And, elephant people? Oh. Yes. And they'd have an elephant head and a regular body. And then to collaborate his story, somebody else reached out to us a while later named Boris. And I think I talked to you about this guy before where he can basically, he, su he summons up or whether or not he summons them up or they just follow him around. He goes outside almost every day in the Bronx and records these U UFOs around other mm -hmm. people in the daytime and says they contact him telepathically. But he also said, yeah, uh, Ray was talking about the elephant people. Um, I know them. I've seen them before. And I, was, I was like, you've seen them physically? And he said, yeah. I have never run into anybody that uh, seen an elephant person before. I, I have run into people who say they've seen what appears to be a salamander type being. Uh, and that's not to be uh, confused with a reptilian. It, this is a completely different kind of a species. But, um, you know, in, in the dimensional world, I think there are, you know, hundreds if not thousands of different kinds of beings. Um, and, and a lot of the dimensional beings are able to interact with our third dimensional world. We just can't interact with them unless we go into a, a, an astral body presence. So, but that's a new one. Uh, the, the elephant one I have not heard yet. Oh, no yeah. He had a whole bunch me. of them, man. I mean, that was actually yeah. probably one of the least interesting that he talked about. What are some other <laughs> ones that uh, you've written about, Bob? Uh, yeah, uh, let me just see something else interesting that uh, is really different. Um, the salamander people, though, I've never heard of that. Yeah, yeah, the, the salamander. Uh, it's it's all it's a strange story because uh, at one point during my interview with uh, his name is Brett Yakubucci, and he's a, an energy worker, and he used to be at one point a paranormal uh, investigator, but he's now an energy worker, and uh, when. 
he was telling me his uh, experiences, and they range from uh, abduction to the point where he's on spaceships and uh, they're being in, involved in a battle with some other beings to uh, having uh, physical uh, experiences in another timeline where there's a, a war going on between aliens and people on Earth and um, humanity isn't doing very well. It's, it's uh, basically a, a scorched Earth, but not, not a nuclear type Earth. It's just that everything's been destroyed and people are just living day to day foraging as the aliens, you know, you know, trump over all the earth. But but when he was telling me these stories, he was telling me that at one day he he was able to connect uh, uh, energetically to another being in an, in another uh, dimension. And he says this is a being and he calls it the salamander people and it's a being that that really uh, doesn't show itself to many people at all uh, unless you have the ability to find them. And, and for some reason, he had had the ability to find him. And when he did, the salamander started telepathically um, talking to him. And, and while he was having this conversation with me, uh, telling me things, uh, the salamander kept interrupting us. And it was really weird while I was s sitting there because he'd stop talking and he'd be, you, you'd see him almost uh, in a trance. And then he would come out of it and he'd telling me that he's he's made a mistake the salamander says this is what really is happening and at some point during that that conversation um, I actually started talking to the salamander through him now at least that's what he told me I have no no way to verify if if I was or not it was just in his own mind that I was doing it but um, uh, it was an interesting experience to be able to talk to some other being um, even if it was a fabricated thing it was just uh, it just seemed very uh, surreal when I was doing it but one of the things that um, beings had told him and actually showed him was that during one of his um, encounters on a spaceship uh, he was shown a map of uh, of the earth and basically it was a hologram map of the earth and there were all these red blue and, and green dots all over the earth and he was told that the red dots represented uh, alien bases on Earth that were benevolent uh, to humans and, and that uh, in some cases they were actually interaction between Earth governments and these aliens. Uh, the blue dots represented the, uh, the bad guys and the, uh, the green dots represented uh, aliens that really don't have anything to do with anybody. They're just here using it as a stopover or uh, just some place to, to live while they're doing something else but have no interaction one way or another. The interesting thing is um, most of the blue, the, the bad things, were uh, centered in the United States. <laughs> and most of the good ones were around the Great Lakes region of Canada. Uh, I don't know what to make about that, but uh, uh, it was interesting that uh, you know the, the bad ones are somewhere down in your part of the neck of the woods. <laughs> Washington, D.C., huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. But the Great Lakes, they were, they were supposed to be fine. Um, it, it's uh, you know I don't, I, who knows uh, he absolutely absolutely believes this and uh, and the, the wars that he experienced uh, there actually was uh, the wars were actually involved what we would call the reptilians or dracoids they were uh, you know the scourge of the earth at the time and there were other um, gray beings that were actually helping uh, mankind try to defend off the uh, the alien uh, armies but uh, we weren't doing that good apparently. But uh, yeah, it, it uh, you know everybody has a story to tell, and one of the most interesting stories in my in, in the book. It's not my favorite story because I, I really don't know what to make about it. it it's a uh, Sinta Asia Narat. Okay. And um, that is uh, I'll tell you how I, I I came in touch with her when I was writing my intrusion book at the time. I I I was trying to get uh, stories that. Uh, were believable to some some extent that that it, it wasn't things that you know people would say well this is completely off the rocker and and who was going to believe this so she contacted me and they emailed me first and uh, her story was pretty wild she she said she had been in contact with a, an alien race and and that she uh, is very close to them and that uh, they've told her all about uh, their society and and she's being watched over by one of their uh, uh, Air Force pilots who who was uh, connected to her, 
and that she had a story to tell me. And and at the same time, she said, people aren't going to believe me and they're going to think I'm, I'm nuts and that's fine because uh, yeah, if I am insane, then I've gone insane in a most delightful way, she said. So I looked at it and thought, well, you know, this isn't somebody that's going to be for this book anyways. And I just put it back in, in my mind and kind of forgot about it for a while. But, but then when I started writing What If Book, I thought, well, I'll see if she's still around and, and, and give her an email. And, uh, and she was. And uh, we started talking and communicating. And before I knew it, she was giving me uh, uh, far more information than I really could use in the book. And in fact, by the time I got finished, I had enough for a book just on her own. But, but I, I cut it down as much as I could and, and put it in the What If book. But it still runs about, the book is about 350 pages. And I would say almost 100 are her story. And it, it's actually a story that I'm going to, put in a PowerPoint and actually um, deliver at this year's uh, Alien Cosmic Expo. And, and I'll tell the listeners about her, but I, I want to preface it by saying that um, she has an interesting tale to tell, and she's a law enforcement officer in, in the province of New Brunswick. So I would have to think that being a law enforcement officer that you have to pass some kind of psychological test. At least I would hope you would. So she obviously passed it. But uh, what she has to tell you is that um, she has been in contact with the Greys, or at least what we call the Greys, but but they're known as the Ataraku, um, and they're from the Orion uh, star system. And the the one of the biggest problems with her story is that she insists, based on what the Greys are telling her, is that the Greys are absolutely the only alien species that have ever visited Earth, and. That, to me, doesn't make any sense because how many people I have talked to have had experiences with other beings? Although, again, I must preface it, perhaps some of these experiences are, again, happening in the fourth dimension and not really happening in the physical dimension here on Earth. But uh, in any event, she says that not only are they they're the only race that's come here uh, ever, like in, in the millions of years, they are the only race that's ever been here. Uh, they helped create mankind, and they've been overseeing our... our you know, civilizations for, for, you know, all these years. And while there are other uh, benevolent species around the world, uh, in the other universes, uh, they insist that most of them have no idea that Earth even exists and that uh, none of them except the Adiraku have the technology and the sophistication to be able to come here. Uh, so I have come to the conclusion that if she is telling the truth and that she is in... Um, a telepathic communication with the being to who are say they're the greys, then perhaps they are deliberately lying to her. And if they are deliberately lying to her, I have to find a reason why, and I'm not so sure I know that reason. Um, that's assuming she is really in telepathic communication. Um, she, she has been given uh, images that she has uh, sketched for me, and she's a pretty good artist. She knows their language, uh, she knows their songs, uh, their history, their society, uh, who they are, wh their contact with the earth, and uh, sh she also insists, in the, or, of course, or the Adiraku insists telling her that uh, they are not the sinister race that uh, they have been made out to be, but in fact are a very benevolent race that uh, violence is not part of their makeup and their whole purpose is for the weapons they have is defensive weapons and to prevent earth from destroying itself or blowing itself up um so it's a it's an you know it's an incredible story because she has so much detail and i have to you know think you know why would somebody go to the lengths she has to just make this up and fabricate a story uh either she has the greatest uh, imagination in history or you know she really is in telepathic communication with something uh, I'm just not quite sure it's the story she has been fed. But uh, I can tell you a whole bunch of more stuff about it if uh, you want. Yeah, that'd be great. And I just wanted to interject real quick. Yeah, it's, sure. it's sometimes so tough to discern from truth and make-believe. And then, well, what is truth? I mean, if somebody truly believes it, if they're seeing that and feeling that event, yet nobody else is, does that mean it's yeah. not true? I don't know. I mean, it's, I, it's, I don't know either. But uh, it's just the fact that she says they say that no other alien species has ever been here. Right. Um, you know, we have, like, how many people, I'm sure people have been on your world program to talk about the reptilians, and I talk about the mantis, I talk about uh, hooded beings, uh, all kinds of different greys, and, and what about all the, the whistleblowers that talk about uh, things? 
Right. I mean, it's just it's just it it doesn't make sense. Um, I I asked for a lot of different events that that are well known that involve aliens, and I got some surprising answers. Um, Roswell, she said, did happen, and that it did involve them, um, and that uh, there was two crashes, and that uh, I think it was seven uh, beings um, crashed, and the the, the two uh, craft that crashed were actually. Um, how, how can I put this? They they were not on a mission. They sort of took it upon themselves. They they had enough of living on the uh, this giant space uh, craft that's hovering uh, in our orbit, and and just wanted to let off some steam, I guess. And so they were on an author, unauthorized mission, and they didn't control the craft uh, quite as well, and that's how they crashed. And she says that you know five of them died instantly. Two were captured. Uh, one of them died quite soon afterwards, and the other one only lasted for a couple of days. Now, the stories that we've heard uh, all along is that the, you know the United States had one alive for possibly as long as a year or longer, and that uh, the Americans got were able to get information that allowed to do reverse engineering. And, and according to what she's been told, one of the the main tenets of being an Adiraku, especially a member of their Air Force, is that they die before they give out any information about technology because they don't want technology to get into the wrong hands, particularly in militaristic hands and that, you know, U.S. were, this it was the military that had them. So um, they would never have said anything about their, um, how their, you know, their, their craft worked or anything about their, their life or anything at all. It basically kept silent the whole time. Um, so if the United States did uh, do some reverse engineering, it was stuff they did on their own from the crash spaceship. It was never anything that was ever given to them by them. And again, she also says they say there have never been any agreements between the U.S. and them to, you know, so allow abductions to take place in return for um, technology. That's just something they don't do. And, and she basically said that all the abduction stories and, and cattle mutilations and, and all that is all made up by the U.S. government to show that the aliens are bad guys. Uh, why, I don't know, um, but they insist that they are peaceful and have never done anything. Um, they, they said that Randallson Forest didn't, didn't happen the way that uh, it's been shown to happen. Uh, they also said, and, and you know, Travis Walton is a guy that's going to be at our um, Alien Cosmic Expo, and his story is well known, and, and I believe it 100%, but uh, they said that his story didn't happen the way he said it happened. And they also did, said that Betty and Barney Hill didn't happen the way they said it happened. But ironically, uh, the Battle of L.A. did happen. And, but, it, but it didn't happen as an, you know, as an invasion. It, it actually was a training mission uh, for young Adiraku recruits to show uh, the recruits that they can never show themselves in, in the, the airspace of, of uh, humanity. Because if they did, they'd be immediately be, be shot at. So to prove that point, they showed themselves... Uh, right after you know Pearl Harbor, um, so, or several months after Pearl Harbor, and the first thing that the uh, you know the, the military did on the coast there was to fire at them. Of course, they couldn't penetrate their, their ships, so it was like a, a teaching moment for the young Ataraku. So I don't know what to make of that. It's it's just it seems so far fetched. But um, again, the, the title of the book: What if What if everything she said is true, and everything we have been told about other things? Is the lie? It's it, it's it's very uh, you know perplexing to me. You know who tells the story, right? Of history. Uh, yeah. It's well. It's the victors. We tell it, the it's, victors. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So we're <laughs> yeah. whatever we know is what we're allowed to know based upon the victors allowing it, and maybe certain secrets and gems that have been passed on from different generations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, she. You know, we, we think of the Greys in some cases when people think they might be robots or or not uh, biological. Uh, somehow they're clones or something. And but she says that they are. Their physiology is is basically very similar to humans. They have you know a heart, lungs. They have uh, uh, tendons and bones and cartilage, and and uh, they breathe air basically. Um, they they uh, their society is almost a. a Almost a communistic society with a dictatorship at, at the rule, but everybody, nobody goes without. Everybody has a home. Uh, they have enough food. Um, drinking water is uh, plentiful, and they don't smoke. They don't have alcohol. Um, 
most diseases are uh, uh, don't exist. Uh, although they do have doctors in operating, because uh, while they can um, successfully, you know, repair things, the one thing they can't repair is brain damage. Apparently, uh, but they can repair everything else. They can do, you know, if you have a heart problem, that can be repaired very easily. And and everything is used by with light energy. Um, they they have very little crime. And in fact, she said, I think in in the last 600 years, there's only been one uh, murder. In any of the two planets, and they they live in two different planets, both uh, with about fifteen billion to eleven billion um, Adaraku on these planets. And when you uh, do commit murder, it's a uh, it, there's no real trial. You you're convicted and you're killed the same day. And you you either kill through incineration, or you are sent to one of their two uh, bug infested planets. And the only the one murderer uh, decided to be incinerated because he didn't want to be eaten alive by these insects and and some of the insects are quite big the but they're also a delicacy to some of them and and one of the insects she she said it looked was the size basically of a large lobster and they have hunting excursions you know three or four times a year to this planet just to for this delicacy um their um their family units i mean they do have family units but it's interesting that the uh, they can have many uh, multiple family units, so there's not there's no such thing as marriage. Uh, but when there's a when children are born, uh, th the husband or the, or the male uh, is responsible for that uh, child the rest of his life, and um, he gets a number, and the child is linked to the father. So whatever job the father has, he always has to provide for it. And while the women do work, the, their main job is to is to raise the children, and uh, it's also to keep the population up. Uh, they, they, there's no big concern about uh, having too many people. Um, they just kind of feed the, the society, I guess. And and she says that you know those large football size uh, uh, spaceships that people have said they've seen in our skies. Uh, they are six such things that are actually in our our skies in our universe, and. Uh, they travel in a much larger uh, spacecraft from their planet, and it takes about it would take about seven years of our time, but they it doesn't take that long for them because they know how to travel at faster than the speed of light, and and they use wormholes and other things to get here. But uh, there are um, although there's six of those. There's six basically they're like uh, giant cities in the sky, and all of the ships can dock and connect to form bigger uh, cities, and from that. They have uh, 400 smaller uh, football-sized spacecraft, and from that, smaller ones come out of there. So apparently there's quite a few in our atmosphere, uh, uh, well, above our atmosphere, in, in outer space, and uh, they say NASA knows all about them. Um, and, uh, you know, the governments, who, the people who need to know, know that they exist too. But uh, they sort of will not provide any any science or any technology as long as uh, Earth is still uh, in a war type mentality. Um, when that ends, they'll be able to help us. So I've but heard that story never before. Happen, for a long. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. But but their you know, average height's about five foot three and they stop growing when they're about 15. So that's why they always look like little kids to people who see them. Um, and they don't actually gray. She says they're more of a bluish, greenish hue to them. Or, or So it's... Uh, I don't know. It's she has so many, so much information that it's just is mind-boggling to think that you know, my God, what what if she is right? <laughs> right, right. Now, now let me ask you this as well. Yeah, sure. Have you done any documentation or research on the like shape-shifting reptilian phenomenon? Uh, I haven't, in the sense that uh, nobody that I've ever talked to has ever told me about having an experience with a reptilian other than Jason Quitt who, who was you know my co-writer for the the forbidden knowledge um, I, I have had people talk to me about uh, what we would call the Pleiadians and the Nords but I have an interesting story to, to tell the listeners that are, that isn't in any of my books uh, only because the lady that was telling me this decided she didn't want to tell me anymore and and she actually lived about 400 miles away from me and she was very nervous when she was talking to me because she really didn't know me. Um, but she told me a very, uh, very strange and horrific story that I have never heard anybody ever tell before either. So uh, here's another one of those. Um, 
if, if I was going to do this uh, uh, story, I, I would call it the horror factory because that's what she called it. And I, her story is that um, her and her daughter, and her daughter's in her 20s, and she's in her, I guess, 50s now or maybe 60s, um, they uh, have been abducted continually, uh, almost, you know, several times a week for as long as they can remember. And it's not by greys, it's not by reptilians, it's not by uh, anybody that, that we would normally think of as being uh, aliens that we can recognize. Uh, these are always very little uh, people wearing uh, monk-type hoods. So you can't see them, but they are nasty and they have these jagged teeth and uh, they come in groups and they basically uh, drag them out of their bed and while they're screaming and drag them down the stairs and, and they do it both at the same time. So she's looking at her daughter and the daughter's looking at her and then there's a blackout. And but that reminds me of those little things you're talking about, those creatures you're talking yeah. about. Um, yeah. The movie Phantasm back in the early 80s. You remember that? Mm, don't know that. When I, when I think of that, I think of uh, Star Wars, the little creatures with the hoods, you know. Oh but, man, uh, phantasm! I, I'm telling I, you, I get, they've yeah. got those creatures with little hoods, and they they got those like cl um, the fang type teeth, you know, the real sharp teeth and the evil yeah. eyes, and yeah, <laughs> I'll have to well, post well, a link I, I, soon. I always think that Hollywood and 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 films like that are based on something that somebody has seen or heard or, or done something, um, and and actually, I've had a couple other people that told me they've had encounters with these little creatures with hoods on, too. So. Um, there's always good to have a validation when you get more than one person. But in this sense, when they're being dragged and screaming, there's a blackout. And then the next thing they know, uh, they are standing in to them what looks like a, a factory of some kind. And they have a sense it's underground because they don't see any lights. And it just looks like a, an underground facility. And there's a conveyor belt. And th they're, they're standing at this conveyor belt. And they have knives in their hands as they're standing at this conveyor belt. And while the conveyor belt is moving, suddenly animals, pets, dogs, cats, are coming down this conveyor belt, and they are being ordered to kill them and stab them on a conveyor belt. And she has no control over this. It's like her mind has been taken over, and as they're coming down, she is stabbing these animals. And she's an animal lover, and this really freaked her out. And off to the side, she sees military uh, soldiers, and they look very human, so she assumes they are our military. And she also sees what looks like um, Palladians, tall, blonde people. Um, there are no reptilians, there are no greys, nothing like that. There's just these people there. And, and this goes on for several nights where this is happening. And when she is returned and wakes up, it's just the most horrible feeling she can ever have. But it gets worse because <laughs> at some other times during the, these abductions, after they're dragged out of their rooms, uh, they're standing on this conveyor belt again. But in some of these ones, she's not actively participating. She's sort of standing off to, to the side watching, the same with her daughter. And this time, coming down the, the conveyor belt are bits and pieces of humans. And it's, it's, while it's still horrifying, they've already been killed somewhere else. And, and, and the people that are there are sort of just examining them as they go by. But everybody's in a trance, and all the people that are standing on these conveyor belts are, are just like her, humans that have been taken that night. Um, she was going to tell me a whole bunch of other stories about other beings and other her horrific things, and then decided that she just couldn't relive all this over and over again. So we stopped uh, talking, and, and one day I hope to communicate with her again because uh, certainly this is something that I have never heard of before and I don't know if you have well I mean I heard of the hooded beans by two different people actually separate mm -hmm. testimonies and um, actually the one was from Kimberly Broussard we had here on the show a while back she's a housewife doesn't have um, any um, any books or website or anything like that uh, she just wanted to come on the show and give her testimony and she talked about this one time she remembered seeing this short hooded being in her hallway looking at her daughter and her daughter was complaining about having a headache all day and then so she basically mm. told it to leave and it took off well well 
these people couldn't couldn't take off that's for sure i um, sent you a link if you can actually click on that link on the skype there to take a look at that picture of what yeah. i was talking about i think it's kind of funny because it. it's a mm -hmm. that was a good a movie by the way for those that haven't the original phantasm just the story behind it i know it's a dated movie and the ones that came out after that were very b rate rated type movies but pretty cool genre back then and just the whole archetype of the film was really cool you had the tall man and these these little robed things that were you know like creations of people at one time that their souls were basically taken anyway very fascinating film it's kind of got its own cult following but um so yeah, i see it i see it now i'm just uh, trying to figure out if i can click on it while i'm talking to you yeah mm -hmm. you should be able to uh, na, 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 it's on the Google. it's on a google thing i said phantasm just, but yeah just click it just click it did the <laughs> men in black send another picture to you oh yeah 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 okay i see it. oh this one looks really nasty yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, the big one. I've seen the big one. Yeah, that looks. Uh, uh. There it is. She described that she uh, just saw their teeth. I think. Okay. But I don't know. I mean, it, that that looks uh, something like you wouldn't. Although one of my other experiencers did did see another little man too, like that, and had red eyes and teeth, and she just thought they were the most nastiest things she's ever seen in her life. But uh, yeah, have you yourself yeah. seen anything real far out? Um, no, um, nothing that I would even say came close to, to what these people are, are saying. Uh, I mean, I had, I had an experience that to this day, I'm not quite sure what it was, but I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, um, you're still there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Cause it looked like you were disappeared there for some reason. Oh no. Um, okay. So about, um, I would say 10 years ago now, I was, uh, still working, uh, as a crime reporter at the Toronto Star, and my wife at the time was was uh, um, she was working at an assisted living uh, center nearby, um, being handing out the meds, and she worked the late shift, so she usually came home after midnight. So this summer night, uh, when she came home, we talked for a bit, and then I went to bed, and she stayed up to watch some TV. And uh, I'm a usually a very light sleeper. Uh, the slightest noise wakes me up. Uh, and my, I used to think I never slept. I would just had cat naps. Um, but uh, that night, I, I, I fell into a deep sleep. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, um, she came running into the bedroom to wake me up, saying I had to get out of bed because uh, there was this strange light that was uh, punching a hole through the clouds in the dark sky. And so uh, I got out of bed. Uh, at least she tells me I did. I have no memory of getting out of bed that night, uh, at least at that point. And she says we went to the front room and she pulled the uh, the curtains back and I looked up in the sky and she describes it as being this uh, basically a light, uh, almost like a, a cylinder type light that was uh, you know putting a hole right through the clouds. And uh, at the same time, there was this tremendous uh, wind storm around our house to the point where the garbage cans were, were flying down the street and the patio furniture in the backyard was just flying all over the place. Now, at that point, I do have a recollection of my wife going out front to get the garbage cans and I went out back to get the patio furniture. And I have a recollection of walking out in the backyard and it, you know, it was pitch black out there. But when I walked out there, uh, it felt as if it was broad daylight. And the strangest thing is that I have no recollection of looking up to see why it was broad daylight. Uh, but I do have a recollection of grabbing the patio furniture, and I do have a recollection of being in this almost like a whirlwind that was all around me. The wind was swirling, um, dust was, was uh, and the dirt was flying up, and, uh, but it wasn't cold or hot. It was just wind. And I, I grabbed all the... Um, the patio furniture, and it, because at some point the wind stopped, I was able to grab the patio furniture, uh, and I remember doing that. Uh, my wife says she came in through the backyard uh, gate, asked me if I needed help. Uh, I have a vague memory of her doing that, although I've told this story so many times, I'm not quite sure whether I do or don't. But uh, for the, our purposes, I, I'll say that I did have a, a slight memory of that. And then we, I went in the house. Now, my wife says we sat at the couch and talked for a few minutes about this storm and, you know, where, how it came out and all this strange light in the sky. I have no recollection of that whatsoever. Uh, in fact, I, I, I have a recollection of going right back to bed. And the next morning, I woke up and in my mind, 
it had been a dream. Uh, but it was a very vivid, you know, almost a lucid type dream. And when uh, when I got up, I asked my wife, I said, uh, did, did, did we get up in the middle of the night to because the furniture was going around and all this wind was blowing around. And she said, oh, yeah, it was, uh, it was the strangest thing, she says. It was just like a, this storm had, had come out of nowhere and, and there was this light in the sky. And, uh, but we didn't talk anything more about it. Um, and then I, re I recall that day talking to one of my neighbors and I mentioned about this big storm we had the night before and, and they didn't know what I was talking about. Um, so that seemed kind of strange because both my wife and I had this vivid event happen. And we really didn't think anything about it for, you know, another 10 years. And then when I started writing stories about experiences, um, one night we were talking with some friends and my wife brought up this uh, event to us. And, but she added something this time that, that I had no recollection of. She says that when she came back into the backyard, uh, I was standing in a blue light, um, which kind of freaked me out because uh, a lot of experiencers who I've talked to have told me that there's a blue light involved a lot of times and, and it's the blue light that is taking them somewhere. So my wife insists I didn't go anywhere that night and I don't remember going there that night and I have no recollections of anything happening to me that night. Um, but I think uh, this summer I'm going to do some regressive uh, hypnotism to just see what happened uh, one way or another. But, but I've never seen um, any kind of aliens per se. Although I must say that uh, I have a friend that, that's uh, a part of MUFON who has showed me a picture that he got from the police involving um, a woman who called the police because of an intruder that came into her house and she took a whole bunch of pictures and it wasn't until they got developed that uh, there was something on this picture and all I can say is that the, she took a series of pictures uh, because her dog uh, was a Labrador that seemed to be standing in place in complete suspended anim animation. There was no movement in front of the dog. She put her hand in front of the dog. There was no reaction. It was just staring towards a doorway that had been cracked a little bit. And so she was taking pictures down the hall just to see what the dog was seeing. And there are several pictures that when you uh, blow up the pictures and in that crack in the doorway, there's what looks like to be an alien being that appears to have, um, I won't say it's a gray, and I won't say it's an insectoid, but it looks like a combination between an insectoid and a gray, but it's very small. It's bent over, almost like it's hunched or almost uh, sitting like, um, like you would do a squat and about to jump, and it appears that it has at least four legs. So it, it, this came from a police file, and they're still doing an investigation on this because they don't know what it is. And uh, this person hasn't been allowed to actually, he's not supposed to have this picture, put it that way, so he can't release it to anybody. But I've seen it several times. So that's the closest I've been to anything that I c really can't explain. Um, th this picture is very freaky. Anybody who has seen this, it, um, it's something that uh, certainly it's a, it's a creature I've never seen anywhere on the Internet or anything before. That's incredible. That is yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah. Now I've seen. I, I I absolutely wish I had it on my cell phone because he, yeah, he won't, he won't give it to me on my cell phone. Huh. I I've seen stuff similar to that. Like I saw this one film on the internet. I mean, you can actually find it if you search for it. I'm sure. And it seems like there's this gray looking type. You know, this large head with the big eyes. But you know, you can't tell anymore with digital photography. If yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, the fact that this is in a police file, that's what really intrigued me. Right. Um, that ad, that certainly adds to the yeah. you know, because it does, you know, I mean, it, it does not look like um, the greys that we have seen. And it's certainly not a mantis being. Uh, I can tell you that. It's probably four feet tall, if, if that. And it's just crouching, staring. Um, and then as soon as it disappeared, the dog reacted again and started barking. So... It freaked this lady out completely. I know that. <laughs> so I, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I would love to be able to tell that story, <laughs> but uh, I can't. There's also another story I'd love to be able to tell, and they won't talk to me. But I'll give your le uh, listeners a little bit of it. You've heard it um, here first, folks. Leak project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's um, and it's, it's this person is actually friends with the person that has this picture, and um, so I know this person exists. Um, 
he has ha had uh, multiple experiences with with the Grays, and um, to the point where um, he lost his wife over it because his wife thought he was a complete lunatic. Um, they have a, a child together, and uh, so they share custody. Uh, the kid is about ten or twelve, I believe now, and basically, uh, these creatures are are continually coming into uh, his house. Uh, they are uh, uh, experimenting with him. He's been taken many times. Uh, uh, he has these horrible memories. Um, and uh, he doesn't know what they want from him. Um, he has lost time many times uh, while driving and, and also stuff about um, even in his house. He'll be in one room and the next thing you know he's in another room and several hours have gone by. Uh, at work one day... Um, he uh, was was he worked in a factory, and uh, while he was uh, working, some of his uh, of, uh, employee friends uh, they came and said that there was these two men outside rummaging through his his car, and they described these men as being you know the typical men in black, and uh, of course when he went outside the men were gone, but the car that he had locked uh, was was open. They had been rummaging through the car, and they uh, had changed all the uh, settings on his radio. Uh, for whatever reason, he has no idea. But later that day when he was at home, he happened to be looking out the window, and he saw two men in, in black again at a neighbor's house across the street. Um, he, After they left, he went over there to find out what they wanted. The neighbor reacted with almost a complete... Uh, frightened uh, he was he was scared out of his wits and told him never to come to his house again and he knows what you're up to and don't ever bother talking to him ever again so whatever these men in black told this neighbor it frightened the neighbor to pieces um, so he's he's told his wife all these things and she you know has no belief in it at all but one day his uh, 12 year old son asked to, if they could go for a ride and he said he said he had something to tell him, and he thought that it was something that his mother uh, wanted to do, and he thought the worst that they were going to move out of town, and and he wouldn't be able to see him anymore. And as they were driving, uh, the kid said to him basically that, uh, Dad, uh, I just wanted to tell you that I believe you because they're now coming to me. So the son is now having all these same experiences with the Greys abducting him and all that. Um, but it's a lifelong experience for him, and he will not talk to anybody. And, and he acts very close to me. Um, but I promised my friend uh, who has the other thing that I won't bother him unless he really wants to talk. So when the kid says something, and that kid actually phoned my friend to tell him the story too, that they're coming to visit him now too. So his dad isn't the nutcase that his mom thinks he is. So what, what are they thinking now then? Are they starting to realize, hey, you know, we made a big mistake? Or they just still have that cognitive dissonance? Uh, I think they're still not talking. I think uh, she just thinks he's putting ideas into the kid's head. Yeah. But the, the kid is, I mean, at, at one point, um, they were, he's seen them over a, a local cemetery. He's seen the flying saucers, and, and they have a, a light that's shining down on the gravestones, just as if they're looking for something. And... Um, oh, that's interesting. There was one. There was one time when they were on this bridge near the near the uh, the gravestone, and my friend and him were there because he was showing him where where this had happened. Uh, they didn't see the the flying saucers that night, but uh, he was just showing him where it happened. And it was about two or three o'clock in the morning. There was nobody anywhere around them. And, you know, this is not a big city; it's a, it's a small town, so even the graveyard is not that big. And um, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's a man. That, that is right beside them, asking them uh, if they know directions for something. And so they're startled, and they had never heard of the street the guy was looking for, but they never saw the guy come up to them, which was the strangest thing, because they would have heard him and would have seen something. There's no car. And uh, when they turned around to, to talk to each other, and they went back, the man was gone. And my friend witnessed this, and it freaked him out completely, too, because... He, they don't know where he went. They don't know who he was or what he was doing there. Um, it almost as if he was watching this other guy for some reason. 
So that only added to his paranoia. <laughs> you know, it's a, it, it's a, it's a strange, um, strange thing. I, I, there was another incident too where he, he got injured at work and he hurt his eye. There was a, and, and he had to go home and he put a patch on his eye and, and they weren't even sure if he was going to be able to s uh, see again quite clearly out of that eye. And he, he recalls where uh, he was lying on the couch and he heard a commotion outside and he looked out the, the front door and he saw, saw several people standing on his front lawn and they were just shining these bright lights towards his house. And the next thing he knows, uh, it's morning. And when he wakes up, his eye is completely healed. There's no damage. There's nothing. The, the, it's as if it never happened. So it's a freaky story. Um, again, it's one of those things you got some validation, and, and it's always good when you have more than one person telling you something and somebody can sort of relate to too. So, well, at least he woke up with his eye healed and not. Yeah, missing. yes, uh, yeah. That was that was the good. <laughs> There's a cyborg uh, eye in there. How did it yeah, get there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But he's he got lasers know. that are coming out yeah. of it now. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know if he's got you know implants in him or, or anything like that. Um, it's uh, you know, as I said, validation is really is very good when you're trying to talk to experiencers. And and uh, one of the ones in, in the book, What If, uh, involves a, a guy named Wes Roberts, and he's this actual school teacher, and he's undergone about thirty to forty uh, regressive hypnotism sessions with uh, a lady named Leslie Mitchell Clark, who is a a well-known uh, Canadian regressive hypnotist in Canada. She's actually uh, now working with uh, MUFON Canada and, and helping people. But um, Wes has had many, many regressions, and and uh, he has this feeling that that uh, he has lived multiple lives before, just like a lot of people. But his uh, whole thing is that he is still living astral lives uh, continually, and. Uh, Leslie's actually convinced that uh, he lives most of the life in another astral body, in another astral world where he probably has a families and other jobs to do. He, he f has a physical existence here when he's teaching and then when he goes to bed and sleeps at night, he's traveling and he's, and he's actually living different lives. And he's had this experience throughout his life where there is a twin that seems to keep showing up wherever he is. Uh, both in physical and, and in an astral plane. And the, the, this twin is usually a female, although sometimes it's a light being, but it usually takes the form of a female. And in some of his experiences, the female is a, is a sister. In other experiences, it's, it's sort of a partner, a wife or a girlfriend. And you would, you know, just by hearing that alone, you're, you're wondering, well, you know, how, is, is there any proof to this? Leslie has told me that on several occasions while he's undergoing hypnosis that she actually has seen um, an entity or, or a, a, some kind of figure lying on top of uh, Wes as he's lying, sitting in the chair lying down and Wes's body actually becomes taller to form this twin and this twin basically is tall with blonde hair much like a, a Nord or a Palladian would be. And when the twin is there, there is a, a noticeable drop in temperature in the room, and she's seen it several times. Uh, so it's not just in his imagination, it's actually materialized in front of her. Um, he has experiences where he feels that uh, uh, he is being transformed into something else, and he has uh, memories and, and, and conscious memories, in fact, of being in front of a council of... Uh, which, which appear to be aliens of all different kinds, and they're telling him that he is uh, transforming into a higher energy being. He's not quite ready yet. And they also tell him that all humans will be doing that at some point. He's just better than most. And um, so he firmly believes that he's just on this in this life for one purpose, but his real purpose is as uh, another being somewhere else. That's an interesting story indeed. Yeah, yeah, which is why I called it unusual encounters rather than encounters of the third or fourth or fifth kind because they don't actually fit into any category that we normally think of uh, close encounters. Right, right, and I think of the, some of the native stories that talk about how mm -hmm. this, when you're awake, is more of the dream when actually the mm -hmm. dream is more of the real world, so in interesting stories that go far back as well. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lady named uh, Kelly 
that I dealt with in my intrusion book. And um, she was at that first meeting that we had in Brantford. And uh, she came up to me afterwards and she said she had a story to tell me. And, and she said she hadn't told anybody else and, and really uh, wanted to get something off her chest. And, and she said, I don't know if you're going to believe me or not, but uh, I'd really like to talk to you. And, and um, I said, sure, sure. And uh, uh, we made arrangements to uh, go to her house. And uh, uh, I had to cancel uh, one of the appointments, and I just left her a, a, a phone message, and I didn't hear back from her, and we were going to do it for the next, uh, I think, a few days later. And when I uh, did finally meet her at her home, she told me that uh, after she had approached me uh, that night at the coffee shop, um, she was really excited about telling me the story. But on the way home, she had this overwhelming feeling that she had betrayed somebody. And it was an awful feeling, like, like, like almost like she had betrayed her best friend to even re reveal that she had had these experiences. And she said she almost called me to cancel the whole thing, but something told her not to. And we then had a lot of regular meetings, and we actually did some retrogressive hypnosis on her too. And, and it was an emotional uh, series of interviews because she was reliving things that were happening. But I'll, I'll, she was basically uh, from uh, born in California and spent all her childhood and, and young years in, in California. And uh, her dad actually uh, was a, uh, a renovator of some kind and, and actually renovated uh, Groucho Marx's house at one point. Um, but uh, she met a Canadian and they moved up here and, and has really spent most of their last 35, 40 years as a Canadian living up close to uh, the town I live in now. And... She, she told me several interesting stories. Uh, one of them started when, when she was a young child and her, and her dad and her, he used to take uh, her and her brother and the mom almost every weekend on a place called the, the Route Ridge, she called it, which is my understanding. It was a, a trail that uh, left Los Angeles and went up towards Bakersfield through the mountains. And the father used to go deer hunting. And at... Um, at one one day they were there, and uh, near the time of when they were about to pack up, uh, they saw what looked like a small plane crashing in the distance, and uh, it went down. And the father said, "Well, there may be some survivors. We should go and and see." And so they she packed everybody got packed up in the in the car, and they headed towards where this uh, object had landed. And Kelly tells me the story that when they got to the area where it had landed. Um, there was no smoke. There was no um, nothing that that looked like a crash had landed. In fact, uh, she says when she looked out the window, she saw a restaurant uh, with Christmas lights, and uh, that seemed to be completely strange. But she was a I think a seven or eight year old girl at the time, and when she went to tell her family about this, uh, the father was missing. He was no longer in the car. Uh, the mother was sound asleep, and she couldn't wake her up. Her brother, who was a little older, um, he couldn't wake up either. So she kept staring at this restaurant and thought that her father had probably gone into the restaurant. And she was interesting, too, and she wanted to go and see what was in this Christmas restaurant. So she got out of the car and walked towards the restaurant. And remember walking up. They weren't stairs. It was almost like a plank. And when she got inside the what she thought was a restaurant. As soon as she got inside, she realized it wasn't a restaurant. Uh, she didn't know what it was, being eight years old, but um, there were two basic rooms in this in this building. And in one room, there was all these uh, humans lined up along the wall, and they almost seemed like they were um, in a trance. Um, she was trying to talk to them, but there was no, uh, nothing got, she got back nothing. Um, couldn't see anything else, but she looked into the second room, and in the second room she saw tons of uh, what looked like operating tables with um, a, a light hanging down, and everybody on these tables were naked, and she recognized one of the beings as her father. And um, so that freaked her out, but then she tried to get the other people uh, to get awake, and and nobody would, would react, and at, at the time... Uh, she then looked towards her right and she describes it as being this being that was on a, a, a pedestal sort of looking down at her and this being had a what looked like a baseball cap on 
and uh, she called him the little captain and the eyes were, were kind of um, not oval but they were more slanted and thin almost like um, you know you've seen that type of thing in the original Fire of the Sky movie where they, they look like the beings look like little old men but they're mm -hmm. not quite anyway she, she hadn't seen Fire in the Sky and this was in the 50s uh, anyways um, or 60s can't remember now um, but um, so uh, she called him the little captain and her best friend was uh, a Chinese girl so in her mind she thought she was looking at uh, a Chinese person because it had the same kind of eyes and, and you know from an eight-year-old mind she, she wasn't thinking aliens or anything like that um, the next thing she knows uh, she's in the car and they're driving back to uh, Los Angeles and nobody's talking about this and it was as if the event never happened uh, except at one point her father uh, suddenly t tells everybody how did it get dark so soon because it was now nighttime and it was about 11 o'clock at night when it should have been about you know five o six o'clock at night um, years later when when uh, her uh, brother was dying uh, of uh, cancer she she remembers going to the hospital and uh, her brother at the time was so sick he never was just in bed and was barely not even talking but she asked him if uh, he remembered the restaurant on the route ridge when they were kids and when she said that he sat up in bed and, and looked at her and said I don't remember the restaurant but I remember the ambulance and everybody in it and so she has no idea what that meant but the fact that she saw what she thought was a, a, a restaurant with Christmas trees to me shows you that whatever these beings are they can control your mind to, to see anything and, and what better thing for a kid is Christmas so there would be no way that she would be scared or anything like that um, a, a few years later she, she is down visiting her best friend again and uh, she uh, lived uh, of Pacoima, uh, California, which is just outside of Los Angeles, I believe, and she, she left the house that day and played with her friend. And, and on the way home, uh, she has to pass a vacant lot, and she's passed this vacant lot, you know, many, many times. But this day on the way home, when she passed the vacant lot, there's a house there, and she can't believe there's a house there, and there's, it's got lots of windows, and the windows are flickering, and it's very inviting looking, and and. You know, she says she can't figure out how a house suddenly appears, but she, for some reason she has to go into the house. So she goes into the house, and when she enters the house, she realizes quite soon she's no longer in a house. Uh, this time she feels she's in an oval room, and uh, there are all kinds of lights on the wall. And she also sees behind uh, a counter, it looks like dozens and dozens of fish tanks. And um, she thinks that's strange, but uh, she's just so in awe about what she's being you know introduced to and then suddenly off to her left um, a creature comes out and this creature is wearing a white lab coat um, and she calls this the doctor uh, and when she was describing this to me uh, she didn't really want to tell me what she was seeing because she thought I think she was completely nuts and I said no no please tell me tell me what describe what you saw and she says well you know the, the only thing that came into her mind was this was a uh, an insect wearing a lab coat and of course she was seeing a mantis being and and she had a familiarity with this as if she had you know seen this before and then and, and they knew each other um, and, and in fact it was uh, Kelly's birthday that day and uh, this creature knew it was her birthday and um, Kelly actually asked the creature how old it was and she said I'm basically telepathically that I'm so old you you wouldn't even comprehend it so, so she didn't know how old she was, but she had been around for a long time. And at some point, Kelly remembers being convinced to lie on a table, uh, but she had no real um, um, fear uh, because she trusted this uh, doctor implicitly. And she remembers lying on this table and looking over at the wall again, only this time when she looks at the wall, uh, instead of seeing fish inside, she actually sees what looks like uh, embryos of some kind. And some of them look actually like real children um, or in infants that haven't been born yet. Um, and then at some point, they tell her that she has to 
uh, go and jump, not jump, but step into the cylinder filled with greenish liquid. And Kelly nearly drowned when she was uh, uh, younger than this, and so she's deathly afraid of water of any kind, and, and getting into a, a tube of green liquid certainly scared her to, to death almost. But the, uh, the creature, the insectoid, the doctor um, convinced her that it would be okay, and she remembers you know, getting into this uh, tube and opening her mouth and she could actually breathe, and it was a, a wonderful feeling. Um, but, and then it ends and she leaves the house and she, she says goodbye to everybody there and she goes home and, and it's been a wonderful experience to her. She, she, she has no fear whatsoever. Uh, but but I, th I think she's 12 years old this time. I think that's what it is. Or maybe 10 or 12. But anyway, she's very young. And as she's running home, she has this terrible uh, pain in her stomach. And it's an unbearable pain that she's never experienced before. And she runs in the house and goes on to the, the toilet, and she ends up getting her period at that point. And she's only 10 years old. So uh, the mother comes, and you know, the mother tells her she's getting her period, and it's kind of early, but uh, you know, she doesn't think up anything of it. Um, years later now, you know, when we're looking at her adult life, uh, through our adult eyes, we kind of think, well, perhaps they did something to her <laughs> to cause that because she was on a table, and she doesn't remember what happened on that table. But she didn't have any really bad experiences. Uh, so the next day she got up and she wanted to go back and see these people in, in this, in this uh, house again because she just loved being there. And she runs out of the house and she runs down the street and when she gets to the vacant lot, it's just a vacant lot. And, and she can't figure out what has happened uh, because the experience was so real. So these were experiences as a young girl that where she, she really didn't have any fears. But, but then we fast forward um, several years later to when she's living in, uh, south of Brantford in a house that's in, built in the 1800s, so it's a very old house. And she's in her house, and uh, her husband's at work, and her son's at school, and she decides that uh, she's going to go up and start reading an Agatha Christie book. And so she, she gets everything ready. It's about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. She's not tired whatsoever, and she starts reading the book. And uh, she recalls that she's reading the book, and as she's reading the book, this strange feeling comes over her. And it's a feeling that uh, almost as if she's been uh, almost being prepared for uh, when you have an operation, that you've had some uh, a needle put in your arm and you're, you're about to pass out, but you're, you're still conscious. And she can't figure it out, and the book drops out of her hand, and she's really fighting to stay awake. And, and suddenly, she has a, a telepathic thought come into her mind, and the thought is, don't be afraid, don't be alarmed, we're coming through your walls. And that freaks her completely out to the point where she's really scared. And she can't understand what, what that thought means. And then all of a sudden, she starts hearing what appears to be footsteps downstairs, and it's creaking down on the, uh, the stairs. Um, now, this is an old house, so the slight movement you can hear. There's nobody in the house but her. She doesn't have a pet at the time. And uh, so she starts hearing these footsteps, and now she be, she's becoming really paranoid. But in the, as well as being paranoid, she's also uh, basically paralyzed. It's like she's having sleep paralysis, but she's wide awake and conscious of what's, what's happening. She can't move, yet she is experiencing and hearing these footsteps. And then she hears the footsteps start coming up the stairs. And now she's really freaking out. And then the voice in her mind says, don't be afraid. We're in your house. We're coming up the stairs. And she's thinking she's having this paranormal experience, that there's ghosts now and spirits coming up the house. She's not thinking anything about aliens. And, um, but she's terrified and to the point where she thinks that she's going to have a heart attack because her heart is just pounding on her chest and, and these uh, creaky stairs are coming closer. And then she... she she manages to somehow turn her body, and she's lying on the, the bed, but she's not facing the, the opening in the door anymore. But she then hears and, and senses that something is in her room, and she senses this thing is now crawled up on the bed with her. And she is in complete hysterical sense. Like she's, she's screaming inside her head, but she can't mouth it. She can't vocalize it. And um, then she feels fingers going over her body and, and on their head and she's just beside herself and all of a sudden uh, she feels this 
movement in the back of her head and it's like they they're somebody's whispering in the back of her head and blowing on the back of her neck and when that happens uh, the fear that she experienced suddenly disappears and she's calmer again and uh and then it just disappears and within a few minutes she's no longer um paralyzed she she ends up uh you know, getting out of bed, but now she's hysterical because she doesn't know what's just happened to her and she has to get out of the house. She's just, she picks up the phone. She can't reach her, her husband. Um, she, she calls a friend and, and asks the friend to come pick her up and, and she's, she doesn't want to be in the house. She says she's had this experience and the friend's trying to calm her down. And so she goes down to the, to the kitchen to wait at the, at the back door for this car to pull up. And as she is at the back door, she notices the clock on the wall and the clock on the wall says 4.30 in the afternoon. And she distinctly remembers it was 1.30 when she went up to bed to, to start reading the book. And she thought 20 minutes at most had gone by, but it was really almost close to two and a half, three hours. It wasn't the first or the last time that this would happen. She had many experiences like that. Eventually, she began to get almost angry to the point where she could move and several times she saw the outlines of, of what we would call grays in the uh, in the room but they were very horrifying experiences and uh, um, none that she would ever hope anybody else lives by because it was like being in your own horror movie she described it as That's so incredible yeah <laughs> I, I hope that nobody has dreams about that tonight well but you can see why she thought it was a ghost uh, experience because uh, you know, <laughs> absolutely a creaky old house. So, well, and another thing too is most people that would experience something like that, I'm sure, would feel the exact same way. I mean, that's and maybe mm -hmm. if you look throughout history, when people have had an experience with an extraterrestrial, interdimensional type being, they look at it as a ghost or a demon or a, you know, spirit or a soul or whatever. Oh yeah, like that's what you would think normally. Right. Uh, I know. I know we don't have much time. I just wanted to uh, say something else about the, the Kelly incident. That that after she told me all of her experiences, uh, one of them there was an experience where the the alien ha had been taken her several times for in, in fertilization. Like she she clearly remembers having. Uh, you know, babies taken away from her. Um, but they they told her uh, soon after she had had menopause that uh, that would be the last encounter that she had and that they wouldn't be visiting her anymore. And and while she was relieved that that was happening, part of her uh, was sad. <laughs> and she can't explain it because she didn't want to have to go through it anymore, but she missed knowing these beings and knowing the experiences. And uh, that's why she said to me that she felt she had betrayed uh, the confidence of these beings by telling me the story in the first place. Um, it, it's it's hard to exp like, if you haven't experienced it. I guess it's hard to understand that feeling. Um, and I really, really haven't encountered anybody else saying that they felt betrayed. They felt they were betraying somebody. Uh, but she actually has missed the encounters, even though they were mostly pretty terrifying. Right. So are you? putting something together right now what's in the works for you Bob oh yeah 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 um couple well actually three things <laughs> um since I did the book with Jason I've had uh, a shaman approach me to do a, a collaborative effort about the story of a shaman's personal journey <laughs> so I'm doing that right now I, I have to admit I know nothing about shamanism but by the time I'm finished I probably will know more than I really want to know um, and then Jason and I are going to do another book together that is going to take uh, Forbidden Knowledge in an entirely different direction. I, I can't tell you uh, who it's going to be on, but it's going to be on another person. And it, this is a person that people in the late night talk show radio uh, genre that you're involved in will know the name once we are able to release it. But it's going to be a completely different story than you've been told. And we've actually signed the agreement uh, today, so we're going to start working on that. And we hope to have it finished by Christmas. Nice. That'll be an yeah, awesome stocking and, stuffer. Yeah, and uh, uh, both Jason and I are going to be at the Alien Cosmic Expo again June 22nd to the 24th in Brantford. Uh, we'll be closing the show with Forbidden Knowledge, and I'll be talking about some of the stuff we talked tonight in another part of the show. Um and we're also been invited to uh, attend a UFO conference uh, in San Jose in October. So oh man, there. I thought you were going to say San Antonio. No, no. Well, unless there, if there is one, San Antonio, and they invite us, we'll be there. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
you know, we're ready to go wherever they want us to go. And um, and I just, you know, um, hopefully people will click on Amazon and buy my books and uh, sit by the fire and uh, try not to be too scared. Um, and probably a lot of the stories they'll be able to relate to. I got to jump in here real quick because you said sit by a fire and read these books. I'm thinking of like going out to the, you know, Canyonlands or something and setting up a nice bonfire and getting you and Jason out there with me. And then you can tell some of these stories, man, because this is, oh, I know they're like campfire. <laughs> I know they're like campfire stories. And, uh, that'd be neat to do it in the Grand Canyon with the Hopi. That'd be, that'd be really good. Uh, something to think about. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you. The next Let's do it thing, at the Alamo. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. The Alamo is kind of a disappointment, though. Once you see it, you're like, nah, okay. Let's go. Let's go to the Riverwalk now. I mean, people want to see yeah. it so bad, and they get there, and they're just like, yeah. mm -hmm. wasn't there? Wasn't there something in is it San, Diego, San Antonio where they found the giant foot, footprints? Um, I don't know, and I should know it's that under, if it's San Antonio, because I should get video footage of that. Yeah, I thought it Riverwalk sounds familiar, but maybe I'm thinking something else. Huh? I'll look I, know, into I, know that. It's in, I know it's in Texas somewhere. Well, dang, I need to get on that. I'm definitely going to check out the MUFON lights here pretty soon because they're about five hours away from here and talk about a strange anomaly phenomenon that's been around for hundreds of years. I'm sure you've heard of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, there's so much strange out there, and that's why I say we, we don't live in the world we think we do. It's, uh, it's a world that, you know, is strange and stranger than fiction, I believe. Because what we thought was fiction is actually not nonfiction. Right. Yeah. So you can get all my books on Amazon.com. What if close encounters of the unusual kind, intrusion alien encounters, and the latest one, Forbidden Knowledge, Revelations of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. What are, what are your websites do? Oh, Before website is uh, bobmitchellauthor.simplesite.com. That'll get you linked up to all the appearances in the books. And I have a blog site uh, where I post things about everything and it ends up on my Facebook, but it's... Um, Bob Mitchell, author .wordpress com. Great. And I can be reached at uh, Bob Mitchell Writer at gmail.com. All right. Well, so. this, was, uh, this was an honor to have you on the show again with us, Bob. I certainly look forward to speaking with you again. Make sure to write another book soon so we can get yeah, you back well, on the show. I, well, I have so many other stories that people have given me that I could put out another experience or book. I just don't know when I'm going to have the time to do it right now. But it's, I'm sure I'll be doing it down the road. Awesome. All right. Well, folks, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight here at The Leak Project. Make sure to become a member with us. It's free. Subscribe to youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Get access to all the latest podcasts first and free. I'd also like to let our listeners know that pretty soon we're going to do a countrywide tour and get some really cool video footage as we go along the way. So if there's places that you want to see, whether it be Area 51 or Dulce, New Mexico, or somewhere out there where the crash was close to Roswell, you let us know and we'll do our best to get there. Thank you for everything, folks. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. This is Rex Bear. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I am your host, Rex Bear, and we have returning guest Bob Mitchell with us, a journalist, best-selling author, researcher, lecturer, executive for MUFON Canada, and co-founder of Toronto Newswire Services. Now, a couple of Bob's most recent books, Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind, as well as Intrusion, Alien Encounters, are going to be the main focus of discussion here tonight because there's just a bunch of stuff in there that I know many of you that listen to The Leak Project enjoy hearing about. So these are just a few of Mr. Mitchell's gems from a collection of several books that he's put together. So quite the resume, Bob. And last time we spoke, it was about the book Forbidden Knowledge, Tells of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. And I spoke with you as well as Jason. That was just a great podcast, a lot of really good reviews. I uh, really enjoyed that. And when I read that book, you put it together so well, it was just very exciting to read. I had a tough time putting it, to, uh, putting it down. So let's dive into your most recent works. And first of all, how the heck are you? I'm fabulous, Rex. Uh, our uh, Forbidden Knowledge is still number one on Amazon's Kindle and uh, going strong. And uh, now it's time to get back to the, uh, 
the normal alien type stories that I usually have been doing and uh, What If Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind is the kind of book that I think people, your listeners will be both informed and entertained and, and that's what I try to do every time I write something. I like to inform and entertain at the same time and uh, certainly there's, there's a lot of different kinds of stories in, in that book that uh, have never been told anywhere else before and, and they're all first timers in the book and um, all very different and I'm sure that uh, the listeners will be intrigued by what I have to tell them. You hear that, folks? You're going to hear it here first at The Leak Project. That'd be great, Bob. Let's get into that, some of these sure. uh, these close encounters of the unusual kind. Uh, mm-hmm. What's the first one that comes to mind? Well, one of my favorite stories uh, is actually the first one in the book, What If uh, Close Encounters of the Usual Kind. And it's my favorite story because... Uh, it took me in a completely different direction than any other alien experience story that I ever um, encountered. And it also kind of opened my eyes to a, another possibility. And, and I think after, after the listeners will hear this story, they will more likely than not have a, a different take on what uh, abductions could be and, 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 and how connected we are to just everything in this universe. So um, it's a very, very interesting story, and you just want me to, to tell it? To, is, is that the way you want me to do it? Yeah, Bob, that'd be great. Let's jump right in. Walk us okay. through it, like uh, describe it as you would in the book to where we're yeah. kind of engulfed in the story. Yeah, and if you have any questions, please uh, stop me, and, and I'll be happy to answer them. And if anybody who's listening has a question, uh, I'll take that too. Perfect. But um, So um, <clears throat> the person in the, in the book that told me this experience, is, is a name. his name is uh, Satya Anon. Now, Satya Anand is actually his real name or his, a name given to him by a Tibetan monk. Uh, it's not the name people would know who he, who he goes by here in uh, North America. Um, he's, he's fairly well known in Canada, this person, and he's a producer, director, uh, a two-time daytime Emmy winning uh, uh, producer in, in the United States uh, a few years ago with some things he did on uh, the Discovery Channel. But at the time we were uh, sitting down to talk about uh, his experiences, he was in negotiations with uh, uh, some people who were going to give him several million dollars to do a project. And he wasn't quite sure what the reaction would be from them if uh, they found out he had this uh, other side to him. So we decided not to go with his real name, per se, that people would know him by, but still go with a name that was given to him by a a Tibetan enlightened master basically so he's a real person and it's his real name it's just not the name that most people would know him by but uh, the story is absolutely true so um, he was born in Montreal and grew up in a normal family there was nothing unusual about him except that that he he got into uh, meditation very early in life and it became a, a basically a lifelong passion for him and, and something he did every day and still continues to do every day and uh, he was fascinated by some of the people he met in Montreal who seemed to have um, connections to people in Tibet. And there was a family that not only had connections to Tibet, but they took their son over to Tibet to uh, to meet one of these enlightened masters. And so Satya thought that was uh, really cool that, uh, that a parents would, would do that. So he... Uh, you know, begged them to give him the, the contact information for this uh, enlightened master, and and eventually they they did. And uh, he went over to India with some friends originally, but uh, actually spent about twenty nine years of his life, not all at once, but uh, off and on, with nine different trips over to India, and actually uh, stayed in one of those Tibetan temples and and learned everything he could about mysticism and and um, incarn- reincarnation. Um, he, he became a firm believer in reincarnation and he also became very, very adept at astral traveling, much like uh, Jason Quitt could do. Um, although he didn't uh, have the same you know, uh, time travel experience that Jason Quitt did. His was just the normal astral traveling where he would leave his body and and just sort of go to places and experience the, the oneness with the universe. Now, when I was first... Um, uh, sat down to talk to him. Um, I didn't know much about astral traveling, um, and you know I had heard about it, and and really didn't know anybody who ever did it before. But I'm since finding out uh, with our book Forbidden Knowledge that quite a lot of people seem to know how to do this. But to me, it was completely foreign. So I, I asked him, like, well, like, how do I know that any of this is really true? That that you have been doing this, and he he told me a story about how when he was over in India, his uh, girlfriend at the time was back in Montreal in the townhouse they were sharing 
And he did an astral traveling from India where he, he left his body and, and actually went into the townhouse that, it, that they were sharing with. And much to his uh, surprise, uh, his girlfriend was having an affair with somebody else. And uh, he saw it clear as day. And, and back then, we didn't have the cell phones. We didn't have the, you know, the Internet that we have now. There wasn't instant text messaging. So uh, what he did was he did a small tape recording on, on one of those uh, mini cassettes and put it in the mail. And I guess two or three weeks later, it arrived in Canada. And when he arrived six months later, um, he went to the girlfriend's house. And you know, she was quite embarrassed and admitted the entire affair that, that he had seen happening before his eyes, even though they were thousands and thousands of miles apart. So, um, in my mind, you know, that, you know, I don't know the girlfriend, never talked to her, but I, I had no reason to believe he was lying to me. So I thought, well, that's, that's pretty neat that he could have done that. But all his experiences were, you know, in the astral world with 360 degree vision. And and really wasn't into UFOs when this was uh, was going on. And d didn't know much about aliens at all. He he might have heard about the Greys, but it was just something he he just wasn't in, interested in. Didn't even um, it wasn't even something he believed that I don't think at the time. But one day, uh, about uh, I think it was five years ago now, um, he was with some friends and and they came back to his Toronto condominium and his friends went on the balcony. Um, and he decided he was just going to go into the bedroom for a few moments and have, I guess, a, a power meditation nap, just to, just to recharge his, his batteries, I guess. And um, he laid down, and then uh, the way he tells the story is almost within seconds of, of lying down, and he had this uh, feeling like he was being shot out of a cannon, out of his body. And it was a different experience than he had usually had with astral traveling before. And... What happened almost immediately, he not only was shot out of his body, but he was shot through the roof of the house and, and he up through the atmosphere. And before he knew it, he was in outer space and uh, traveling very fast. And he could actually see the planets go by and, and he could recognize the Earth and it was getting smaller and smaller. And then, you know, Mars and Venus and all the planets. But as this was happening, he actually looked down at himself and lo and behold, uh, it wasn't this 160 degree experience that he had had before. Uh, at, at this time, he was actually, he could see his body. He could see the docker pants that he had on when he uh, would lie down in the bed. He had the same running shoes on. He had the same T-shirt. He could feel his face um, and, and, and his hair. And so he was in this physical form, yet he was traveling through outer space with, without a space suit on. Uh, he was breathing fine. And he was just, you know, accelerating faster and faster and uh, could not figure out what was going on. And eventually he left the, uh, the solar system and he expected that to see, you know, more stars and, and keep going. And suddenly he found himself in, in just other blackness. There, there was nothing around him whatsoever. But as he sort of floated there, because um, the acceleration had stopped, and, and as he floated there, he, um, he had this feeling that there was something or somebody watching him, staring at him. It was almost uh, ear eye piercing. Uh, he described it as... Uh, if you're in a car and you're stopped at a, at a stop sign or stop light and you look over because this person in the car next to you has been staring at you and when you quickly look over they turn their head quickly so they don't want you to know. Uh, it was that sense that something was staring at him and it was really strong and suddenly in the distance something is coming towards him and you got to remember he doesn't know anything about aliens really other than grace. So uh, before he could you know, take a deep breath if that was possible in outer space, but before certainly he had any emotions of fear or horror, uh, what he was looking at, right in front of his face, like within inches of his face, was this huge being. And um, he describes it as being at least 30 feet tall, perhaps even in bigger. And it had giant eyes and the head, and the head he, f he thought had to be at least five feet uh, large and because the, the eyes were three or four feet big and it had the image of uh, almost a mechanical insect that was the way he described it because the head seemed to be like a like an insect but the the long arms that were flailing by its side um, it, they seemed almost mechanical in some ways but uh, instead of feeling fear he the only emotion that came to him and it was a very very strong emotion was this overwhelming feeling of love and attachment to this being and it was kind of love that uh, he said was stronger than even the kind of love that you would have for your parents or even uh, your, your wife or girlfriend. It was, it was this intense love that filled his entire body. And while he's there, 
there's a telepathic communication. And, and during this telepathic communication, he has this feeling that he knows this being. And, and, that, and it's so strong that he, he asks this being, have, have we been together before? And the answer he gets back is yes from the being. And then he says, he, he looks at the being and he looks at himself and, and he, he telepathically says to the being, in your form or in my form? And the answer he gets back is, it's in the being's form. And, and that really you know, freaked him out at that point. And uh, then he asks him, uh, will we be together again? And the being says, yes. And again, he says, in your form or my form? And the being says, in its form. And within seconds of that, he finds himself back uh, in his bed. And he wakes up. And when he wakes up, he has this uh, you know, uh, wow moment because all his life, he, he believed in reincarnation. He believed that, you know, he has had past lives on earth and that he has, um, um, you know, possibly even been an animal or, or a plant, but was always earth-based. And now suddenly he had this revelation that uh, reincarnation wasn't just something that happened on earth, but when you came back, you could come back as anything in the universe because we all were connected to one source. And, and sometimes you live a life as an alien, and sometimes you live a life as a human being. And uh, he quite soon tried to, you know, look up on the internet to find anything that resembled what he had, had seen up there. And um, he eventually found something, and of course it was the well-known mantid creature that, that uh, has been very popular in the last, I would say, the last five years at least. People are talking all about mantids all the time. And, and in fact, in... In my book, Intrusion, Alien Encounters, there's two people that, that have had mantis experiences. And although their experiences were with seven or eight foot tall creatures, they all had the exact same uh, overwhelming love for this creature. It, it wasn't any fear whatsoever. So after, after digesting what uh, Santa Anya had said to me and, and knowing that um, other people have had this experience, uh, it seemed to me that... Um, this love, this strong connection uh, is actually something that has happened in a past life. That these are celestial beings that, that are part of uh, everybody's uh, makeup and that uh, the reason there's so much love between them is that they're actually probably looking at your relatives uh, from another timeline maybe or from another dimension. But somehow the mantis beings are connected to humans uh, because uh, most humans who have had abduction experiences certainly don't describe abductions by greys or hooded beings as being nice and loving. It's always fearful and, and horrible. So I, I think the Santa, uh, Santa Ana's experience um, may just open the doors to a lot of people uh, who have had these experiences. It, it certainly made me rethink some of the things that were happening. And, and in fact, maybe if I can take that even one step further, um, if reincarna reincarnation does exist in everywhere in the universe, um, perhaps that when people are being abducted, and, and I believe they're probably being abducted mostly in, in, a, in a conscious form, not in a physical form, but when they're abducted into like the fourth dimension or other multi-dimensions, that perhaps they are being abducted by their own relatives, uh, that somewhere along the line they've, uh, you know, they've told them that when they come back in this form, you will be taken back to see us again. Because so many people that I've talked to during their abduction experiences, at some point, they have a telepathic communication that says to them, you know, uh, we're doing this because you agreed to this. And I don't know anybody who would agree to such an experience unless 